Thank you. How's everybody doing today? Great. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. I typically have two, uh, two volumes to my voice low or strength coach mode. So I'm going to try to be in between there. So um, just to give you a little background on myself, first of all, I want to thank Scott and the NSCA uh, for putting on this great event. We've had some fantastic presenters. How many of you guys learned something today and yesterday, right? How many of you guys are going to go home and say, I need to read a lot more? Okay, yeah. Thanks, Jimmy. Where's Jimmy? Jimmy's not even here. Jimmy, are you here? No, okay. So uh, just to give you a little background on myself, because I think it's important about what I'm going to talk about. Um, I've been at University of Michigan for two full seasons now. Um, I started my career. Um, I played hockey since I was about five or six years old. Love the sport. It's a huge thing in my life, uh, my family's life, everything. So um, I knew from a young age that I want to do that for a career. Uh, when I say young age, maybe freshman in, high, in college, uh, somewhere along those lines. I went to the University of Rhode Island, played hockey there. Not very significant, not a very good player, but I love the game. So that's not really has anything to do with my talk at all. Uh, when I was done at the University of Rhode Island, I did an internship here at the USOC. So Robin, who's in the back, Robin, raise your hand. Robin and I were intern partners together uh, in the physiology lab. So I always knew that training was a huge part of sport. I knew that coaching was a huge part of sport. Uh, when I got there, it opened my eyes to something that I've never seen in my life, right? And I think Robin can attest to it. It started my career, it started me on a path that's very different than uh, I feel a lot of others. Um, it opened my eyes to not just the coaching side of it, not just the training side of it, but actual planning side of it. And that's what I'm going to talk a lot about today. So uh, when I was done at the USOC, it was about a six or seven month internship. Um, I went on and I got my master's degree in Shreveport, Louisiana, uh, at a satellite campus, LSU. And when I was there, I worked under a guy named Kyle Pierce. Um, he's considered to be one of the best developmental weightlifting coaches in the world. I think he is the best, and I think he's one of the best weightlifting coaches, period. He's had multiple Olympians come out of there, multiple world championship team members, stuff like that. So when I talk about weightlifting, I talk about Olympic weightlifting, but for me, it's a weightlifting movement. So when you uh, hear me talk about weightlifting, know that that's different than weight training. Um, from my time, when my time finished at LSU in Shreveport, uh, I got my job, my first job at the University of Richmond. Um, I was a, an assistant there. I worked under a great guy, taught me about training environment in a collegiate setting, in a team setting versus an individual setting like weightlifting. Um, I was fortunate enough at that point to earn the right to have a position at Yale University. Uh, I spent about six years there, six full seasons almost. Um, and we started off building that program. I came in and coached Elaine's second year, um, and we kind of culminated that with a national championship in 2013. Uh, I did a brief stint with the Army. I did a, a brief stint with the Special Operations Group down in Savannah, Georgia, um, and then I got a call from Michigan. Um, Michigan's a place where you don't really turn down the opportunity to work there. So this is our mission statement. This is our philosophy. Now, I've had a lot of different experiences. Um, I've worked with 80 or 90 different teams, okay? Lots of different athletes, lots of different coaches. Um, I've been doing this almost 12 years now. Um, the one underlying theme is what I'm going to talk about today, is planning, OK? We have all these great ideas. How many of you guys learned something new today that you want to try to implement, OK? Yesterday, you learned something new that you want to try to implement, OK? Planning is a huge portion of that, OK? And every coach that I've talked to, every head coach that I've talked to, every athlete that I've talked to, all the successful ones have a plan. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Um, for me, I typically try to spearhead the annual planning within our teams, within my teams, with, with my coaches. And to give you a quick little example, a couple years ago, I was working with a baseball coach and we were talking about a lot of things and he was trying to have, figure out his schedule and his travel time and stuff like that and when to train and whatnot. So I went in there and we talked and we sat down for about six hours and we planned out the entire year. Now this is a coach that's been doing it for 22 years. When we came up with what I'm going to show you, um, He's never seen it before. He looked at it, he goes, I've never seen this before. It makes perfect sense. It's the strategy behind what we need to do. He could see that in six weeks or eight weeks or nine weeks, what was going on and how we could go ahead and plan for that. From everything, from the logistics of travel to the logistics of who's starting as a pitcher, so on and so forth. So again, this is a guy that's been coaching for 22 years. He played 20 years or something like that in MLB. He's never seen anything like that. It's just some things that I think you guys can pull from this as well. So. Um, Again, what is an annual plan? Has anybody set up an annual plan? Anybody ever sit down and, and set up 52 weeks or more, okay, from start to finish? Okay, so an annual plan, it's a, it's, um, it's a tool, right? It's your strategy. It's your roadmap. I came here from Michigan, from Ann Arbor, right? I had a map, 
of how to get here to Colorado Springs. I had a plan. I got to the airport, went to the other airport, flew, so on and so forth, right? If not, I don't know where I'm going. It's the same thing here. That's what an annual plan does. It's a component of periodization because it divides a training area into distinct phases. So basically you have a block of time. What you're going to do during that time to make sure that your athletes are getting the optimal performance down the road. Not so much what's happening right there as it is down the road. What do you want them to do down the road? You've got an athlete that comes in and they're 17 years old and you want them in two years to be a 19 year old phenom. There's a lot of work that needs to be done there. If you're just guessing and plugging things in, it's not going to happen. They're going to get lost, right? So point A to point B to point C to point D, right? And I'm going to talk a lot about that with on the individual side as well as on the team side, okay? Um, basically, Bompa talks about this as um, directing an athlete through 12 months of training. So the biggest question that I have for you guys as well, um, have it, has anybody ever seen anything like this? Has anybody ever put anything? Raise your hand if you have, okay? Has anybody talked to a coach or brought this to a head coach before? Has anybody sat down with a head coach and done, done anything like this? Okay, so this is my template. This is a template that we use at University of Michigan as well. It basically has just all of our scheduling stuff, all of our resources, and where we're gonna emphasize certain things because there's gonna be times of the year where you don't need to emphasize or use resources that are available to you, right? Just because you have it doesn't always mean that you need to use it. So this is kind of just a, a, a map and a guideline of when you're gonna use certain things and when you're gonna emphasize certain aspects or variables of training, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so my question for you guys, again, if you guys have any questions also just raise your hand and ask. Uh, it's a little bit better when we're a little more interactive. So question for you guys is how many guys work your players out? You lift, how many guys take players in the weight room and lift? Okay, you take them to a track and you run them. Okay, you take them out to the ice and you, you skate them. However, whatever method it is that you use. Okay, Jimmy, how are you? Okay, so I don't do any of that. Okay? I don't work players out. I don't condition them. I don't skate them. I train them. Okay? So this is one thing at the University of Michigan and everywhere I've been that if we talk about it, if you open up the dictionary and you look at what training is, this is the exact definition of it. I don't work players out. I don't skate them. I don't condition them. I train them. All aspects, right? Everything from the mental side of it all the way through the nutritional side of it, through the weight room stuff. So yes, we work out. We have workouts. That's all played into a training plan, okay? If you, have, if you think that everything you do is training, and I get this across to all my players as well, I sit them down when they first come in and I tell them, everything you do is training. It doesn't matter if it's a video session. It doesn't matter if it's a power play practice. It doesn't matter if it's a skill session. A game, wins and losses of games, uh, training table, weight room, everything you do is training. Whether you're making the right decisions out of, away from the rink, if you're making the wrong decisions away from the rink, that's training yourself. You're either training it negatively or positively. Everything you do within an annual plan, within a year, once you decide that you are gonna to start to become a hockey player for the following season, is gonna play an effect on what you're doing. It could be positive, it could be negative, right? Player says, well, you know, I stayed up till three o'clock last night and I was out at the bar or whatnot. That has a negative effect on his training session that day, and that has a negative effect on the road. Now those minute things are not necessarily gonna play a huge picture, but when you start to see a lot of patterns in that, that's when you guys start to have issues, right? That's when players start to have issues. Does everybody get that? Okay, so with that being said, textbook definition of planning, right? Open up the dictionary, this is what it says. So scheme, method, act of doing, proceeding, making developments in advance, right? So this is what I'm gonna talk about, right? I'm gonna talk a little bit about what we do here, right? Mostly gonna talk about this, okay? The strategy behind what you're doing. The way things flow throughout an entire year. Does it make sense? Is it logical? Are you manipulating the right variables at the right time? I'm going to present to you what I do, what I think I'm doing, how I think it works. You might think it's, it's different. You might think you might have a different opinion. That's fine. But what I want you guys to get out of this is how to go through and plan and how to look at it planning, right? How to manipulate certain variables, right? So again, planning. What, when, where, why, who? What are we doing? When are we doing it? where the players are or where we are when they're doing it. Are they on campus? Are they off campus? Are we at home? Are we away, right? Why we're doing it, the goals that we have during that time. Who's doing it, right? You have your freshmen, you have your young players that are coming in with a low training age. They're not gonna be doing what the, the older guys are doing, right? I take my freshmen for a certain amount of time to teach them what they need to know. They're still training, they're still learning, but they need to know what they're doing so that they're not trying to keep up with our 22 or 23 year old senior that's been in there, right? 
Now, sometimes you get a stud that can blow those guys out of water. It happens, but they still need to take time to learn what they're doing, right? Versus maybe a high minute guy, right? We have a guy that plays 25 minutes a game. Well, he might do something that's a little bit different as well than the guy that's not, right? I personally am more aggressive with those high minute guys than the other way around. Why? Because we need to count on those guys to be productive, to be fit enough, to be able to take and handle those minutes and recover from it. So there are certain times of the year where those high minute guys, I'm hammering them. I'm hammering them. Why? Because you're a guy that we need to key on. You're a guy that we need to work on. You're a guy that we are going to count on as a team. Does that make sense? Okay. So what we're not going to talk much about is the programming, the how. Programming for me is the exercise selection, frequency, intensity, duration, sets, reps, whatever methods it is. I'm going to breeze over some of that stuff. If you have any quick questions specifically about it, you could ask them afterwards or just throw your hand up and ask how we do that. But I'm not going to talk about that much. Again, why? Because this is a strategic plan. Okay? This is your roadmap of what you're doing. It's not necessarily why, or it's not necessarily how you're getting those variables or, at, or how you're training your players at that time. Does that make sense? Okay. So periodization, right? I think we can't cover this enough. Uh, every time I give a presentation, I always put this definition up here. So uh, it's a method of manipulation of trading variables in order to increase the potential for achieving specific performance goals. So basically, you got to get player, right? He's young. A little on the weak side, you want to get him stronger. How are you going to manipulate those variables? How are you going to manipulate those sets and reps, intensities, et cetera, et cetera, to get him strong? That's, for me, what periodization is. That's the definition of it. Annual planning is the thought of the strategy of those, of those plans, of those variables, right? Because you get a guy strong, well, a byproduct of that is he's going to be powerful, but you need to train him to express that power, express that strength, right? How many times have you seen a guy, you're like, that guy's strong as a bull, but he can't do anything in the weight room? He needs to learn how to express that strength, and learning to express that strength is going to go ahead and allow him to be stronger, gain strength, so on and so forth. So the annual plan is the strategy of all that, right, of athletic development. The biggest thing here is for me is athletic development as well. I'm not training hockey players. I'm training athletes. We've heard that time and time again throughout the last two days. But for me, if a guy doesn't, can't jump, he can't squat, he can't run, he can't this, he can't get that, that's great, but that's also limiting his potential on the ice as well, okay? Right, he could be a high-end player, but if he can't do those things to a moderate, to average, above average level, then he's limited on what he can do on the ice. If you could take those variables and train them and get him better at that stuff, you're gonna improve and kind of unlock that potential for him on the ice. That's a true belief of mine. I've seen it happen time and time again, um, and that's with every sport. So I'm gonna train the athlete, athletic side of him. Athletic development. So what's athletic development? What are you looking for with athletic development? Anybody? Throw something out. Strength, good. Strength is one of them, right? Strength is one of the great underlying factors of athletic development. It's one of the things that you could always train. You could always get somebody a little bit stronger, right? Doesn't matter if it's five pounds, 10 pounds, 2%, 20%. I put 50 pounds on a guy on, on his back squat. I put 100 pounds on it. You could always get guys stronger. Explosive. Explosiveness. So explosiveness is another one, again. You got a guy that's really strong, right? How many, how many of you guys have seen something that squats 500 pounds, but they got a 20 inch vertical jump? I've seen it, it happens. You need to express that strength. You need to turn that strength into power, right? Um, what else, anything else? Athletic development? What is it? Acceleration. Acceleration, good. So again, we know what the variables of athletic development are. When are we gonna put those in? Is it appropriate to train acceleration when we're in a high volume phase? No, right? Is it appropriate to train uh, conditioning when you're trying to get guys stronger? Yes and no. You ask Jimmy, yes, no, maybe so, here and there. Um, but so there are all these different things. When you have a philosophy, you have a thought, you have tools in your mind, you go with that. You plan it out and you go, right? Make it logical as much as possible. So within a college program, I came up with this list, and this list was probably about 70 points long, right? I had so many things that I'm looking at, and my mind was swirling. Right? I had things, I had a whiteboard like this with so many different things that we've tried to achieve, we have resources for. So I tapered it down to 10 things. Again, it could be 20, it could be 15, it's a matter of how you categorize it, right? So these are 10 things that we have to deal with on a daily basis within an NCAA program. First and foremost, because it's important to me, strength and conditioning. Well, what are we doing in strength and conditioning, right? We know that there's all these variables that we have to train, these all these things that we want to do. So it's one thing, but there's really 25, 30, 40 different things that we're going to do with that revolve around strength and conditioning. Performance nutrition, right? We have a great nutritionist on our staff, so I don't have to deal with nutrition as much here at Michigan as I did at my other places. She's a professional. She gets paid a lot. 
She's a nutritionist. I bring her in when we need our plan for nutrition, when we need our interventions, when we have problems. She's a professional, she does it. I don't jump over that line. Do I have the ability to? Maybe, but not to the level she does. Psychology, we have psychologists on our staff, right? We have a psychologist that deals with everyday problems. Uh, we have psychologists that deal with performance. We have a psychologist that's a former player of ours that comes and talks with our guys about culture and teamwork, et cetera, et cetera. While it's for me, in that annual plan that we talked about, to go ahead and delineate when they need to come in, when we're trying to implement some programs, and what programs we're gonna implement at that time, right? So in April, after our season's over, we're not necessarily gonna talk about visualization and, and whatever else that's gonna get them to understand from a psychological standpoint. What we're gonna talk about is how to deal with what, we just, what just happened to us. We just kicked the crap out of ourselves for 380 days and we didn't achieve our goal. We have players that need to, and as a team, we need to move past that. That's when we bring our psyche in and talk about that. Does that make sense? That's over my head. I don't know how to do that. We bring them in, we talk to it. We, ha we have them talk to it. Again, in June, then maybe we bring them in and start to talk about goal setting, start to talk about visualization, start to talk about some of those high-end performance stuff. December, January, he's gonna come in and talk about that stuff as well, okay? So again, we have professionals that take care of all this. Technology, we've talked a lot about technology, right? Who's learned something new about technology? I've learned that I need to up my game in this, but we have a technologist on our staff. We're actually, uh, and at the University of Michigan, we are in the process of making a big investment in technology. We're doing a lot of upgrades in our facilities. We're doing a lot of things. This is gonna come with that. So I've planned on having these upgrades over the next year. Uh, hopefully it's gonna happen in the next few weeks. If not, I'll readjust what we're doing here. But there's gonna be a minimal to a maximal amount of uh, uh, technology that we're gonna use. Recovery, everybody knows about recovery. Well, when are you gonna plug in big bouts of recovery versus small bouts? Uh, power skating, everybody's got power skating, skill development, what the coaches are doing, academic calendar. Right? How many NCAA coaches do we have in here? What do you think about the academic calendar? <laughs> yeah, it's a challenge, right? Uh, Kara, NCAA rules, those NCAA coaches, how many of you guys like the rules that the NCAA puts in place? Yeah, don't raise your hand because nobody does. Um, NCAA rules, did you guys know that in the off season we're only allowed eight hours of training time with our players? So in their highest preparation phase, we're only allowed eight hours. With all these things here, can you fit that into eight hours in one week? No, that's, that's just one eight-hour workday. So we have to be creative with what we're doing there. CARA is uh, accountable athletically related activities. So there are times of the year where I can't track our players, right? I can open the gym. They can come in and work out. I can't coach them. <laughs> that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard, right? So how do you deal with that as a coach? How are you creative with that as a coach? If you plug all that stuff into your plan, you can see when that's coming up and you can plan for it, right? Travel, guys are in and out of campus, they're in and out of practice, team travel, et cetera, et cetera, right? So again, you take all that, that builds into this, okay? So all those things, as well as those 30 or 40 other things that weren't on that list are all right here. Now you see all these colors, you see all these lines, all these boxes, so on and so forth. So I'm gonna spend a couple minutes and go over this, all right? Uh, up at the top here, we've got month. So 12 months, April to April. Okay, why do I pick April? Anybody know? Why do you pick April? End of the season, right? National championship game is in April, okay? So that's when we start our annual plan and that's when we finish the next annual plan. I plan on playing in a national championship game every year. It's an expectation that we have in Michigan. It's an expectation I have as a coach. If we plan for it and we don't, then we just initiate some different things that happen in that time frame. If I don't plan on playing there, then we've got some issues later on down the road. Right, so plan for the most that you're gonna do and then adjust with the less that you're gonna do, okay? Underneath that, I've got day, right? So we've got day one all the way to day 379 or 385 uh, in the full year, okay? So that's the Monday, we start on Monday, that's day one. The Monday of the last week is 379, so 386 days that we've got in a year, okay? The month, uh, I'm sorry, so at that point we go through the, the micro cycles as well, week one all the way through week 54 and I'll explain microcycles in a minute, but basically they're just weeks of the year, okay? Down there, we've got our uh, schedule, or I'm sorry, we've got our academic schedule right here. So all the things that are pertinent to our team from an academic standpoint, okay? Uh, we've got when exams are, when semesters begin, when summer begins, you know, et cetera, et cetera. I plug some other stuff in there as well, 4th of July, Christmas, Thanksgiving breaks, stuff like that. Again, that's information that's really important because if you see, we've got this stuff right here. So I've got, uh, I think this is the end of one semester, exams, the beginning of another. So what's gonna happen during that time? I could see right there that there's a bunch of stuff that's going on. 
man, I have our team for the spring semester. So this entire time is a spring semester. I've got a bunch of time to do a lot of stuff with them. They don't have much else going on. Then here, the spring semester ends, their exams start, then the summer semester begins. That's a big block of time I could do a lot of stuff with. This here is the end of the summer semester, so on and so forth, right? So you can start to see patterns, right? Three weeks, four weeks, two weeks, six weeks, eight weeks. Sometimes it's broken up, sometimes it's not. What I don't do is put any of their NHL stuff on here. Uh, as Crash said yesterday, he showed yesterday, if you put all that stuff in, you're never gonna have time to train, right? My job, quote unquote, is not to prepare them for their NHL camps. It's not to prepare them for anything like that. I will get fired if our players aren't prepared for our season, but you come in and you say, well, yeah, they had a great NHL camp. They had a great development camp. They had a great everything. Nope, sorry, see you, Joe. See you later, you're out of here, okay? So that's my job. Also, from a cultural standpoint, it's great that they have individual success, but we care more about team success, period, plain and simple, right? Questions on that? Okay, so from there, uh, we've got our academic, I just repeat the month, the uh, micro cycles again in the days, and then this is every day in that year, so this is 386 days that are planned out. Now this is a PDF version of it, but I have a working cell sheet on this with earmarks all over here, so I can go in and I can plug in May 15th and I can click on that, that'll be hyperlinked to our workout for what we did on May 15th and our training sessions on that time, right? So as we get into January, February, that's, that's hyperlinked in the rest of the Excel sheet to what we had for practice, right? What we found in practice, what we did for travel, et cetera, et cetera. So these gray areas here, they just delineate month. These big red areas here, that's 4th of July, that's Christmas, so those are major holidays. Those are also major times in terms of that I will take breaks. Um, these dark blue areas here, those are non-conference games. The maze here, or the yellow to most, uh, is our Big Ten games, okay? And then from here, it's orange, it's kind of hard to see. That's our playoff time. This dark blue area right here, our bright blue area is the Frozen Four, okay? Gray areas here are our travel days, to and from, and we go through it. So I've plugged everything in, I've got our schedule. This is all earmarked with what we're doing, so I can go through and count. All 34 of our games are on here, that's what these are. Okay, you take it up to almost 44 games if you play in a national championship game. Questions on that so far? Then we have all our resources right here. We've got our weight room stuff, right? Strength and conditioning work, our conditioning work, nutrition, technology, psychology, recovery, on ice training, skills, teamwork, et cetera, et cetera. So, and I've just basically labeled these high, low, right? One, two, three, high, medium, low. And that's what these are here. So this shows you the emphasis of what we're doing at, the, at certain times of the year based off of what's going on up here and what's going on here as all the resources that we have, okay? And for me, this makes sense, right? So if we're in a weight room, right, and we're here and we're doing some moderate weight room stuff, we're gonna do some moderate conditioning stuff to get a certain variable, to get a certain adaptation from them, right? Our nutrition's gonna be high at this point, right? We're gonna do certain things here, our technology's gonna be low, and I'm gonna get into all this stuff here, okay? And also as a working sell sheet, we, it's easy to make adjustments on this. So a coach comes in and says, hey, we got to back off for a week or two for whatever reason he feels like the guys are getting burned out or whatever. I go back and say, well, actually, we really haven't done that much. So something else is going on. Guys are getting sick. Well, because it's been negative 40 for the last eight days, we need to do something to help them with that, right, et cetera, et cetera. Or, <clears throat> and if they, we end up do making an adjustment, say, here, right, with our team stuff and our practice where we're going to take some away or whatever, that has a domino effect with everything else that we're doing. If I go ahead and I make some adjustments here, that's got a domino effect with everything that we're doing for that week as well as weeks to come. Okay, does that make sense? You guys all see that? Okay, down here at the bottom, this is our sports stuff. So this is gonna be based off of their practices. Uh, I just labeled it one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Uh, those are just nine variables essentially that you're gonna practice. I don't tell coaches what to do during this time. I don't design practices, but I will talk to them about the intensity of their practices, the flow of our week, and then I'll plug it in here. So, you know, we might have December 15th, I have one, two, three in here. So that means that we did skill development, we did speed development, we did passing work, right? And then so we could go through and I'll hyperlink that back to our practice plan, right? Um, here, the strength and conditioning side of things here, again, this is a working sheet in Excel. So volume in terms of poundage, right, or tonnage, Volume in terms of reps, plug those numbers in, it gives us our graphs so you can start to see your periodization trends at that point, right? How many times have you written a program? How many guys calculate volume, intensity, right? Sets times reps times weight gives you a certain number. How many times have you programmed three weeks and then all of a sudden you realize that that trend is downwards? Like, well, the intensity is going up, the weight's going up, et cetera. But the actual tonnage that you've moved over a week is going down, right? 
So it happens to me all the time. I'll plug some stuff in, I'll, I'll take workouts, I'll take protocols, I'll put them in, and then all of a sudden I realize that we might be lifting 5,000 pounds in a week here, and we're lifting 3,000 pounds in a week here, and then over here we're lifting 2,700. Where our trend is down, maybe I want it to go up, right? So that's just a good tool for me to go ahead and say, okay, this is what we're doing, right? And then it also has reps on there as well, so you can see, okay, well, we did 5,000 pounds in 300 reps on one week, we did 3,000 pounds and 200 reps in another week. So now you can see that the intensity was up at that point. So it just gives you trends, a visual idea for trends, okay? So I just wanna go over some of the definitions of this stuff and this stuff because it's important as we go through. Now, you guys all read literature about periodization? You guys all read books, Bompa's book, Doc Stone's books, so on and so forth. So a lot of that stuff is talks about individual, uh, track and field, swimming, throwers, et cetera. I've taken that and I've kind of applied it to, um, through Zatsky Orsi's work, I've applied it to a team setting. So the definitions might be a little bit different than what you think or what you're, what you're hearing, but the, uh, the idea of it is the same. So the macro cycle, that's this entire year. Macro cycle right there. Meso cycle is a system of several micro cycles. So several weeks linked together and what you're trying to achieve at that point. Micro cycle is a grouping of seven, several training days. In the off season for me, it's seven. In season, it's 14. Okay, daily is just what you're doing each day at that point. So the workouts, okay, are here, right? The microcycle, the trend of the week is here. The mesocycle, the variables that you're looking to do are here. And then the macrocycle is what you're looking to do the entire year, okay? You guys get that? Am I boring anybody? No, okay, good. Uh, so if you go back and look, if you look at a 2015, 2016 annual plan for me, what I put together going forward, okay? It starts on April 6, 2015, and hopefully ends April 24th. The national championship game is April 9th. We want to be playing in that game. We want to win that game. So I plan on the, the annual plan being all the way through April 24th. That's 385 days. Have you guys ever set up a project that you're doing in three weeks, and then just that week revisited that project and said, okay, I have no idea what I'm doing? Well, it's the same thing here. How do you plan for 385 days? You have 385 days ahead of you to have reach a goal what you're gonna do along the line. That's what the annual plan is, okay? Transitional phase, right? So an annual plan is gonna consist of three phases. Transitional phase, preparatory phase, competition phase. Okay, everybody got that? Transition from one competition phase to another. Preparatory is all your big preparation, your off-season work. Competition phase, obviously in season, then transitional. Now, if you talk about individuals like swimming or track and field or what have you, these phases, there may be many of these phases here, right? You may have a competition that you're peaking for for a national, you know, a national event, and then you've got a transitional phase, and then a preparatory phase, and then a competition phase. So in a team setting, we basically uh, lump it together to look like, well, look like this again, okay? So basically our transitional phase is over here, our preparatory phase is here, our competition phase is here, our transitional phase is here, and that's right here, okay? Transition, preparatory, competition, Transition, got it? Okay, so for us, March 14th is when our, we initiated our transitional phase. That means we lost our last game on March 13th. So the previous year's annual plan went through April 19th because of uh, the national championship game. We lost, our season was over. We initiated our transitional phase March 14th. And that goes through April 24th of uh, the following training plan, right? So 2015, 2016 annual plan. So it's uh, finishing up with the 2014, 2015 year, starting of the 2015, 2016 year. Preparatory phase is April 27th, October 14th. Okay, so April 27th is when we initiate our preparatory phase, and then it goes all the way through, and we end that on the 14th, which is the day before our first game. Competition phase starts on, April, on October 15th, and goes through April 9th, national championship game. Okay, if we're not in this game, then we will just bump this back to whenever our last game is and whenever our season is finished. Then at April 9th, April 24th is a planned transitional phase two. Again, we end earlier than that, we just bump it back. We give it about a two to three week period depending on how our players are, how we evaluate them, and we start to move forward, right? Okay, so during that time, okay, these are, all the, these are some of the things that we talk about. 42% of that time in an NCAA season is gonna be spent with me and me alone, okay? so. 161 training sessions in that year. Depends on what you call a training session, um, but 42% of that time is with a strength and conditioning coach, okay? That's not including pre-game warm-up, post-game cool-downs, pre-practice warm-up, post-game, uh, post-practice cool-downs, 
individual sessions or anything like that. The bulk of the team, 42% of the time, is going to be with just me. Now, I'm with them 100% of the time. I'm with the team on travel. I'm with the team at all the meetings, all the meals, everything. There's not anything that I miss with that team. But 42 of that's going to be dedicated to just strength and conditioning. 25% of that time is going to be practices, right? About 98 practices. We might have a little bit less or we might have a little bit more, depending on what we're doing and what we're planning on during a month or during a week. Uh, mandatory, 23% of that time is going to be days off. NCAA mandates that you have to give them that amount of time off. You'll see why in a few minutes. But in the off-season, you have to give them two days off. In-season, you have to give them one day, one day off. So that's going by NCAA rules. That number will actually probably increase. We tend to give them more days off at certain times of the year uh, than, we, than we don't, right? 8 to 11% of that time is going to be games, 34 to 44 games throughout that year. You're playing in 44 games. You're in a national championship game. You're playing 34. You had an awful season. Um, travel time, 5% of the time. Uh, and this is team travel. So we'll have 20 travel days, uh, basically 20 weekends. It's going to equal about 40 days away from our home building. Now, that being said, last year, our training plan, we traveled nine weekends in a row. Okay? We spent almost 55 days away from our home rink without playing a game there. Right? We were all over the place. Okay? So that's stuff that you need to plan on. Looking at our schedule next year, it's about 5%. Okay? We may leave a day earlier, we may come back a day later, but again, it's gonna give you approximate times, okay? So again, that transitional phase, so I'm gonna get into a little bit about what we do during these times. I'm gonna get into some of the mesocycles. So if you have questions about any of that stuff, please just ask. Um, our transitional phase, again, like I said, started and was initiated March 4th, oh, was initiated March 14th. So we played our last game on the 13th, 14th initiated the transitional phase. It went for over a month. Why did it go for over a month? Because right around the 12th of April is when we had exams. The semester was coming to a close. We're not going to do much during that time, especially if we just lost the season. Our season was over. You're going to kind of take into account what it is that we're doing, right? So we're not going to do much team time at that point. Again, we, we also don't have the ability to because of our exam schedule. Um, during this time, I want the guys to decompress. I want them out. I want them out of the rink. I prefer to lock the doors. We lock our locker room. We lock our weight room. Get out. Get away from here. Go do other things. Get away from, let your mind kind of relax, right? Um, I do encourage them to do some soft tissue mobility and flexibility work. So at that point, basically, we all know about ankles and hips and all that other stuff. We work through that at this time. We try to get them back to baseline. Uh, this time frame is not necessarily long enough, but it's, we start the process at that point, right? Right around April 6th, we'll start to reintroduce some training concepts. We'll come in and we'll go through an anatomical adaptation phase. So getting them to lift again, starting to uh, strengthen ligaments and tendons, things of that nature, all those adaptations that you're looking for. We'll start to do some light general, general, general physical preparation, some GPP work. Again, just to get them back in the groove of lifting, right? Let them get through some of the soreness. Let them start to go through the movement patterns that we're starting to learn uh, or reintroduce those movement patterns um, that we're going to rely on heavily later on in the next couple of weeks. I don't do any conditioning with them at, at all. They can do whatever they want. I encourage them to cross train. I want them to go play volleyball, baseball, soccer, go play another sport, right? Crash talked about how important that is. We want to get them away from the rink, right? There's going to be about a three-week period where they don't put their gear on. I know that. It's locked in their locker room. They can, right? Go play another sport. Go do something else. Go for a run, right? We had, I had a guy do a 12-mile run during that time. That's great. Awesome. Go for it. Have at it, right? Uh, but what we do have a lot of focus on at that point is we start to implement a nutritional intervention program. So we have our, I bring our nutritionist in. She's going to do a lot of educational work. So presentations like this, she'll do some one-on-one -on -one counseling. We're going to look at our body composition, reassess that, look at their eating, eating habits by having some dietary recalls, what they thought they were successful at or not successful at throughout the entire year, et cetera, et cetera. Again, she does that. I don't. I just help with it. I help work with that. So. April 27th is when our preparatory phase starts, right? So this is when the fun stuff starts. This is our off-season. This is our summer, right? We go through eight mesocycles. That's going to last 24 weeks. That's going to include our preseason or our specific preparation for ice hockey, okay? All we're doing at that point is we're emphasizing a basic continuum of strength. We're going to start off with GPP and work our, all our, work our way all the way through the hockey-specific training or the power speed endurance training. I use block periodization at that point, so it's going to be four to six week blocks. I feel like that's what works best within an NCAA season for a team. So we're going to take a time and focus on one variable. That does not mean that all those other variables go away. But what it means is that we're really emphasizing one variable at that time. Okay? And then over those eight blocks, those eight mesocycles, all those variables have been trained. And then with that last one, that specific preparation, we're getting them to understand that all those variables we trained, 
we can express now through a hockey player. Does that make sense? Questions on that? No? Yes? Do you have any adaptation loops when you decouple by Say that again? Do you have any adaptation loops within those cycles where you're increasing volume, increasing volume, and then decreasing volume? Yep, so I'm going to go through that. But all these cycles are basically going to be on a three or four week to one. So uh, we're going to slowly or aggressively, depending on what we're doing, increase the volume, then drop it off and deload them. So, um, but again, that's going to be dependent on what we have. So you'll see when I talk about it in a second, but we have a spring term that's eight weeks long. So a four to one is not necessarily going to be appropriate at that, po at that point. So we'll do more of a six to one, okay? Because again, we're looking at the, the, the trend of what our schedule dictates. How do you uh, reconcile this with testing rather elaborate, very individualized for the player with the NCAA rules of uh, disengagement? So that's where the culture of our team steps in. Do you put the sheet on the table and say, I'm going to walk out of the room if I come back in and she is missing? I no, no, so that's actually not what the NCAA rule says. We can give them workouts, we just can't track. And what that means is I can't track things and then give them to coaches to report back. I can track weights, I can track body weights, I can track all that stuff, but I can't report that back to the coaches, right? Um, so, because if not, you're not training them, you're not doing your job, you're just no, kind of what's guessing. The under the table going on here? There is none, right? We're, we're transparent in what we're, what we're doing. So the culture of the team require, is what, they, what dictates what they're doing. So. There are times of the year where it's come and go, and I, we don't have players that miss, right? There are times of the year where they have to go, we're in a discretionary period, so I can't monitor who's there, or per se, I can't monitor who's there, meaning I can track their weights and stuff like that, but I can't take attendance um, and report that back to coaches. We, we don't have guys that miss. They just want to get better. That's the culture of our team. Does that make sense? Does that answer your question? Yeah, the, the players, in a sense, uh, fulfill their commitment. Yes, yep. So, and that's a big thing that actually we'll talk about in a second. The culture of our team is what we talk about. So, um, again, during the preparatory phase, obviously we're going to have a pretty, pretty strong nutritional, technological, and psychological component. So, meaning I bring in professionals to deal with this, I deal with this a little bit, and I bring in professionals to deal with this, okay, for the most part. I'm going to be somebody that's going to be the leeway, kind of the go-between with those, we'll implement some stuff, but I don't do it per se, right? So, let's get into the fun stuff here. So. With our preparatory phase, we start off with a GPP mesocycle. So this is 17 workouts, give or take. Um, that's exhaustive. Anybody ever go through a GPP phase, like a true GPP phase? Anybody ever seen anybody that goes through it? GPP is exhaustive. If you're not exhausting yourself at that point, you're not doing things properly in my mind, okay? I've seen athletes do it. I've done it for a long time with these athletes. Um, it's something that I'm doing for a certain reason. The goal of that point is to increase our work capacity. So they just spent five weeks sitting on the couch, not doing much, not doing anything that really resembles training. They've been doing some, uh, some light lifting, some light GPP work. So we're gonna take that and we're gonna increase that work capacity a ton, okay? Those workouts are gonna be anywhere between 45 and a minute, and an hour and 15, and they're exhausted, right? They don't like it. I like it, it's fun. We crank the music, we mash, the guys come in, they get after it, but they go after, they have to deal with some adversity at this point, right? They're sore. They're tired, they're beat up, and that's only after Monday. They gotta come back again and do it on Tuesday. Then they gotta do it again on Wednesday. Then they do it again on Thursday. Then they do it again on Friday, right? They have the weekend off, they get the recovery, we come back, we do it again, okay? For me, this is meat and potatoes of what we're doing, right? This, is, this isn't the end all be all, but um, if we're not increasing our work capacity, we're not doing things to push them and push that limit and push their bodies, then we're not, uh, I'm not doing things properly at that point. So. I know Jimmy talked a little bit yesterday about the acidity and you know players live in acid, in acid and so on and so forth. I agree with that. But that for me is also what makes hockey players unique. So that's a variable, that's a trait that I don't want them to necessarily lose. So I want to take it and bring it forward for just a little bit of time. Not enough to do any damage, not enough to do anything that's going to be detrimental, but it's actually going to be positive for them in the long run. right? Um, operational tempo, so I talk about operational tempo. When I worked with the Army, I did a brief sim with the Army. Um, down in Savannah, I was really friendly with the colonel. He talked about operational tempo, and it seems kind of cliche. A lot of people have probably heard it before, but in a high-stress environment, you go back to your lowest level of training. So if our lowest level of training is this, then when we are in a stressful environment, our bodies will go ahead and revert back to this. Um, does it necessarily always work out that way? I, I, I tend to believe so, but either way, they're flying. Like, we're flying. We're not doing much rest. We're not doing anything. They know that the second they walk through the door, we're, it's go time, right? 
it's fun. It really is. The guys, they hate it the first week. By the second, third week, it's, it's enjoyable for them. Um, other people think I'm crazy at that point, but that's okay. We'll address some body composition stuff as well. Um, we have an aggressive and progressive conditioning scheme. So in the, oh, 10 minutes, okay. So in the, uh, in the spring term, I had the entire team there, so we're gonna get as much conditioning out of them as we can at that point. We have a pretty strong nutritional program at that point, obviously to get them through this, right? Uh, but we also start to have an in intervention program at that point, so we're teaching them about how to eat, how to prepare their food, what to eat when, how to eat after workouts, intra workouts, et cetera, et cetera. Our nutritionist does a great job of being able to periodize all their, all their nutrition and, and can individualize it for everybody. So psychological component at this point, I don't bring the psych in at that point. That's a lot of our culture. That's a lot of our teamwork. They're gonna go through adversity with each other and they're gonna get through it. Our captains will take rein on that. I'll let them lead our team, right? And I will just help push them in the right direction. Okay, our core values that we have as a team, we will re-implement, reintroduce, and redefine at this point, right? So we have core values. Well, it's not gonna be the same as what it was in 2014, 2015, because A, that didn't work, B, it's a different team, C, it's a different mindset. So we're gonna redefine that as we go forward, right? Technology at this point, we don't use. We know they're tired, they're grumpy, they hate it, but they love it. I, it, it that's a waste of time for me at that point. So then from there, we go from a GPP. Again, this has a deload in, involved with it. We go through basic strength. We'll, the goal for this is foundational strength. So we do a lot of five sets of five. We do a lot of 75, 80, 80%, 85% during this time. We're just trying to get them strong. We train sub-maximally to make them be successful in all their lifts. I back squat, and I back squat a lot. Right, twice a week, if not three times a week, depending on the, the players. Why? The more practice you are, the better you're at. For me, that's the best, one of the best ways to express your strength, um, and that's how we do it, okay? We have huge increases in strength at this point, huge, right? Again, diff some different methods. If you wanna ask about that, we can talk about it later. Uh, we have a slow progression towards speed, so that means that we just cut our interval times, our interval distances down, to try to get them to run a little bit faster because in the next phase, our power phase, they have to run fast. So we're just slowly starting to progress them towards that speed, okay? We'll do some slight acceleration work, we'll do some start work, stuff like that. But again, to get them to practice so that in the next phase, when we are really hammering the speed work, then they have already done it, right? Uh, nutritional component is still there, pretty high at this point. We're working on recovery, we're trying to teach them how to recover with nutrition, fuel, and we're starting to address some body compositions as well. Guys that need to lose some weight, guys that need to put some weight on, we'll address it during this time as well. Again, that's something, body composition is something that's not done in six weeks. It's done in 36 weeks. So it's a constant battle and a constant increase or improvement of that, okay? After we're done with that, we go through max strength cycle. This is about two weeks. Um, we are here to increase the expression of maximal effort strength, okay? So we are trying to set PRs. We are trying to get our guys to be stronger than they were the year before. That means we're using a lot of 85 to 100% loads, multiple sets of singles and doubles. We did a workout the other day where they did 19 singles, okay? Anywhere between 75 and 95%, okay? So the earlier sets were obviously warm-ups and stuff like that, but they did about eight singles above 90% at that point, okay? Yes? On those singles, how long did you let them rest? Two to three minutes, as much as they need to be able to accomplish that weight. So we're setting them up to be successful at that point. Um, ironically, we have less missed lifts during this time than we do during this time, than we do during this time. Why? Anybody have any ideas? Rest, Rest? what else? PR. PRs? Pra how about practice? They just have more volume, right? So they've just done 200 reps or 300 reps of certain exercises. So now this is, they're starting to express that at this point. They have more practice at it. The more you practice, the better you become, right? The more, and that's where that mindset of training comes in. Uh, conditioning intensity will increase. The moderate, there'll be a moderate increase in volume, not much at that point, nothing really significant, but uh, we start to introduce shuttles at this point as well. We have a very high nutritional emphasis. This also it is the end of our spring semester, our spring term. So that means that, and this right here, this recovery mesocycle is July 4th. So basically we're testing them at this point. We're testing, we're doing a baseline conditioning test. We're doing uh, all of our baseline one rep max testing to go ahead and build off of for the following uh, cycles as well. Um, recovery, again, like I said, this is July 4th. So they basically get 12 days off, right? We did all this work here, we did all these things, they went through everything, we created our culture, five minutes left, a lot of stuff left to go through, uh, but we give them plenty of time off. Uh, they'll do a little bit of training at that point, a little bit of lifting, a little bit of running, just kind of keep in par and keep the ball rolling what we did here, but this time here, 
they're off. They're off on the beach, they're taking vacations. A lot of times we have our guys that are going through their development camp, camp at that time. Um, so we'll have kind of a decrease in the volume of our players that are on campus at that point. And then right around July 10th, we come back and we start another mesocycle. At this point, we're doing power and speed. So remember, we talked about everything's training, everything's building off of each other. So we set strength, right? We increase our strength. Strength, byproduct of that is going to be power. You're going to obviously be more powerful the stronger you are. But we're teaching them to express all that power and speed here. All right, we did some of that speed work that we talked about before, slowly progressing towards speed work. Well, now they're looking to express all that speed here. Goal of this is to increase our rate of force production, specifically our peak rate of force production. So I want them to be, we do a lot of impulse training. I want them to be able to, when they go, they're going. And it's going 100%. Bang, go. I don't care if it's from here to that door. They're going as fast and as hard as they can. I don't care if it's 100 pounds on the bar or if it's 300 pounds on the bar. Everything's moving as fast as possible. That impulse to be powerful is there. Right, we're going to use moderate loads because that's what kind of the research shows is that any, right around that 70 to 80 percent range is when maximal effort, uh, max power is going to be there. Now, again, the variables that the other variables, that strength variable, it's not gone. We still revisit it with some 90 percent work, but that's not the majority of what we're doing. Again, we'll use some different types of different methods of training at this point, potentiation, contrast training, et cetera. Some of those things that you guys have learned over the last couple of days or that you already have. So basically your philosophy, what you have should fall into some of these things here. You start to implement that at that point, right? Um, I'll start to go through this a little bit quicker. So we have a power, speed, endurance, mesocycle at that point. So all this power and speed, that's gonna be low to moderate volume of that. This year, we're trying to increase that volume. So maximal effort, repeated bouts of power, of speed, et cetera, et cetera. Because that's gonna start to transition to sports specific speed, which again is hockey. So how many of you guys want your hockey players to be out there for three minutes? and just kind of float around. No, we know through shift times, we know through technology, stuff like that, that's multiple bouts of speed. That's where we're starting to train here. Um, they, we start to reintroduce hockey at this point as well, so I'll take them on the ice and do some conditioning work with them as well. This is gonna be right around mid-August. So that volume of on ice stuff increases, so they've done stuff on ice on their own, that's fine. Some skill stuff, some shinny hockey, whatever. I'll go out and I'll actually start to do some power skating with them as well. Uh, we'll start off with edge work, take about a six week progression, go from edge work all the way through over speed training. Um, nutrition starts to become a big factor at that point again as well. So the nutritionist comes back in and starts to talk about things. So then we revisit our max strength mesocycle. This is the beginning of September. So we have everybody on campus again back here. This is the beginning of our academic year. So we'll do some testing, right? So we do one rep max testing again. Um, bench press, back squat. Uh, power cleans, we do a multiple, uh, a max rep 25 pound pull-up test. We do jumps, et cetera, et cetera. We also do our, our conditioning test. My conditioning test is 200 yard shuttles. We do 10 of them, two minutes rest in between. All of them have to be under 34 seconds with individual goals for each guy. We do that here as well, okay? And then we start to bring in our nutritional stuff as well. Once this is done, it initiates our preseason cycle, which is gonna be mid-September uh, when the NCAA allows the coaches to start to go on the on the ice with the players for skill development, that's when we start to go through all this here. So that's when hockey specific training is gonna be done in all areas. Everything we're doing in the weight room, on the track, on the ice is all geared towards hockey specific at that point. That's about a five week cycle. So I think I'm coming close here. Any questions on that? So that's basically our preparatory phase. Yes? That 200 yards, what distance do you have? 50 yards. Can you just repeat the, the test Yep, so one rep max and bench press. Power clean, back squat. Uh, with my freshmen, I will actually do a three rep max and a back squat uh, just to get a baseline for them. A 25 pound pull up test, we do max reps. Standard for that is 17, is 17 reps. Uh, we do a broad jump, we do a vertical jump, we do our shuttle test, we do a stadium run and a partner and a, and a team race during that time as well, a team competition during that time. Yeah. Any other questions? 17 reps with 25 pounds? Yes. That's our standard, so that's our pass fail line. So we have some guys that fail that. Full extension. Full extension, yeah. We have some guys that fail that, some guys that blow that out of the water. So 17 is just the, the average for it, so yes? So you have every one of your athletes with three throws the whole summer, like you're going to go home at all? No, so again, because the NCAA rules and regulations and yeah. things of that nature, um, the culture of our team is that most of the guys will stick around, they'll take classes, so they'll be able to train with me. Um, but there's going to be periods of time where that volume is going to decrease. So, but for last year, we had 19 of our 20 guys there for a majority of the summer. 
So I'm not allowed to sit there and tell them that they have to. That's the NCAA rule side of it, but they do it anyway. So uh, I think they understand through all those resources I showed you that this is a one of the best, better places for them to train, right? So, and then also with the team concepts that we do at that point as well. Any question? Any other questions on this? Yes. Do your freshmen come in at the beginning of June, or do they come in in September? So the freshmen are a little bit different. The NLI walk uh, freshmen that are. Um, getting their scholarships, they're allowed to come in earlier. Uh, the walk-ons are not. Um, so we deal with that at two minutes. So we deal with that on kind of an individual basis with them. So any other questions on the prep phase? Because I'm going to get into competition real quick. I'm going to breeze over this in about 45 seconds because we all know what it's like. So NCAA, our competition phase is 168 days. We're allowed to get 132. So that means that we, the NCAA mandates at least 36 days off. So at least one day off a week during the competition phase. That's 26 weeks, so that's two weeks longer than our preparatory phase. So again, imagine that. Your competition phase is longer than your preparatory phase. So basically what that means is that you have those 34 to 44 games, those 100 practices, all that travel time, the academic schedule you have to really deal with. So the goals during this time are still to increase power, speed, agility, endurance, have a high emphasis on increasing peak rate of force development through different modes and methods of training. But we spend a lot of time getting strong. So that means we want to stay strong, right? We want to be healthy. So if you were to take 26 weeks and go into a maintenance phase for 26 weeks, what's going to happen? Yeah, what are you maintaining? You're nothing. You got nothing left after a few weeks. So we continue to maintain, we continue to build, we continue to push. We're aggressive with what we're doing. Our volume's just not very high, right? And we take a lot of things into account. Like I said, our microcycles go from one week to two weeks at that point, seven days to 14 days, because that's what works best with our schedule. If you go through our schedule, we have multiple bouts of bye weeks. So we'll have weekends off. We use that time to train and train hard during that, well, that time as well. So um, maintenance, quote unquote maintenance, what most coaches are thinking usually starts right around mid-February mid during that time. We spent a majority of the year getting strong, being strong, so on and so forth. So we go into a maintenance phase at that point. Now maintenance for us is not backing off. It's actually ramping up to play our best. So we want to play our best in the NCAAs. We want to play our best in the Big Ten. We want to play our best in the bulk of our Big Ten schedule. We have to ramp up. We're not backing down. Right, so we'll have short, intense bouts of training two to four times a week, dependent, really dependent on our recovery time during that session. So again, in conclusion, this is in your manual. You guys can read that. But it's an extremely powerful tool if it's done right, if it's meticulously maintained, if it's communicated with your coaches. If you're doing this on your own and you haven't told your, told your coaches about it, don't bother. It's not going to do anything. You could use it as a guideline for what you're doing in the weight room, but everything else isn't going to work. Right? And one take-home thing, if you guys don't take anything but this from me, Plan, execute, revisit, replan, re-execute, revisit. I look at my annual plan at least two, if not three times a week, okay? In season, we talk about it almost every Monday as a staff. If you're not planning what you're looking to do, then executing that plan, then revisiting, understanding where weaknesses and strengths were, where you were success successful and where you weren't, then you're not doing anything. You're not actually looking at anything, it's just a piece of paper. Got it? That's. The entire year is a constant plan, execute, recycle, uh, revisit. Plan, execute, revisit, right?